All right. Well, our next question sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Daniel Duran in San Antonio, Texas. I wanted to ask about any incidents having to deal with locker room thieves. Roddy Piper mentioned in his book that Gorilla Monsoon had once set a trap to catch a thief when the wrestlers were noticing that their money was missing. Also, there was an incident where Rick Rude knocked out PN News, stemming from the rumor PN News was suspected of being the thief at that particular locker room. Have you heard of these two incidents? Is there any truth to them? If so, do you have any details? And also, do you have any other stories about locker room thieves? Well, I remember hearing something about uh, the Rick Rudin PN News thing was what mid '90s WC or early '90s WCW, and I was not there. I probably I don't 91. know the details. Yeah. I also remember vaguely Piper telling a story of Gorilla setting a trap, but I can't remember what that story was. But uh, the overall subject of the question, which is who's stealing shit in the locker room, or were they, or what stories about it? Back then, the locker rooms in those days, I mean, now not only you go to a a big event like a WWF event, and the locker room's supposed to be sacred, but the locker room's sacred except for every goddamn technical person that needs to come in and out because they're shooting shit, or everybody on the writing team, which now numbers 20 or 30 or 40 or production. I, I, when I was there at the Hall of Fame thing, Vince now has two assistants that come to the matches and are just there to do stooge work for him. Just uh, That's the only thing they do. I mean, we used to all do the stooge work for him because he didn't have a specific stooge, but there was actually a guy there that was waiting with three or four suits for Vince so he could pick which one he wanted to wear, and he was just sitting out there for an hour holding those suits, waiting for Vince to come out of his office. So point is, in the old days, the only people that were ever in the locker room were guys on the card. And the exception to that rule was if if the Kentucky or the Kentucky, if the state athletic commissioner, whatever state, was there, yeah, the, the commissioner got to go in the locker room. But there's a state employee, right? In my experience, in a lot of these towns, most of the towns, even the police, the uniformed city police officers that were working security, never came in the locker room. They picked you up right at the entranceway of the dressing room as you were coming out, and they walked you to the ring or whatever. They walked you to the car. They weren't allowed in the locker room. I, as photographer, until my actually, I was the photographer in Louisville and Memphis and Evansville for six years. And I never actually was allowed into the locker room in Louisville until my first day as a manager. It was downstairs. I didn't need to go down there. I took all my pictures upstairs. You were on a need-to-go basis in the locker room. I'd been close in Evansville sometimes because I'd go down to record radio spots down to a certain place that we could get quiet but was still not in the locker room. So it was only the boys. It wasn't like it is. You go to independent shows, everybody's there, every friend, every employee of the building. I saw the Louisville Gardens building manager in a seven or eight year period go down to the locker room area one time because there was a busted fucking shower pipe. Otherwise, the wrestling promoters, usually most every place I had experience with, made it clear to the arena, we're renting this building we're paying for the staffing, so we will decide where they can or cannot go. So have I made it clear that nobody besides the boys, the managers, the referees, and the people involved in the promotion, with very few exceptions and only for limited amounts of time, were allowed in wrestling locker rooms? So when something starts turning up missing, it's got to be one of the boys. And certain guys had developed reputations. I remember hearing about a guy, Bill White was an old-time wrestler. And uh, I've seen him wrestle when I was a fan. I was never in a locker room with him. But he, they called him Bill Watch Your Poke White. Did anybody know what a poke is anymore these days? Probably not. Okay. It's your fanny pack. It's your wallet. Your poke. What you got your shit in. Carrying your poke around. Well, they called him Bill Watch Your Poke White because when he would be in a territory, things would fucking happen and people had made accusations or whatever. 
you were leaving your wallet in your bag or you, you know, and, and a lot of time, obviously it'd be fucking goofy if you open your wallet and all the money is gone, but locker room thieves, if they could catch, and there were very few of them, but it happened. But if they could catch the locker room empty where a lot of the guys are watching a match at the curtain upstairs or you just whatever, and they had the opportunity if they knew a guy had a lot of cash on him, they, if your wallet had $400 when you went to the ring and you came back, it might have 200 And a lot of guys used to count their money after they came back from the ring. And I always wondered why I'd last Dennis Condry. And he told me that. You wouldn't notice at first. And then you'd be somewhere else. And you'd go, well, what? I thought I had more money. Or if there was whatever the, you know, the, uh, uh, choice was at the time was there weed in the bag was there pills in the bag was there fuck whatever there was in the bag sometimes you would see uh kind of sort of get a feeling somebody was doing something and 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 you would ask somebody if they would watch you while you opened somebody's bag if you felt like something was in there that people would recognize as it shouldn't be. It was yours or it was somebody else's. It shouldn't be in this guy's bag or, and poor, and there's been debates on this, but poor Sean Stajak, when he was in the locker room in the nineties and the WWF, he had a tape recorder running in his bag that, that he left running. Uh, I think he was accused of leaving it running to see if people were going to talk about him behind his back after he left the room. Cause he was a person who was, somewhat high strung about things like that but they thought he was fucking taping them for fucking to stooge on somebody or whatever but anyway so you would come up with various ways if you couldn't prove that somebody in the locker room was taking shit or poking around in people's bags or whatever the easiest way i also learned this from dennis condry you know what the easiest way is to make sure that your shit is taken care of if you suspect one of the members of the roster is a thief padlock or stick a gun in their face i don't know no since all the territories only kept like fucking 20 guys on the roster you're in the locker room with 10 or 12 heels or you're in the locker room with 10 or 12 baby faces and you suspect one of those people is a thief every single person in the locker room would go to that person before their match and say hey here's my wallet can you keep an eye on it for me well now they're fucked what are they going to, I know you have my shit now, motherfucker. And I know what I just gave you. So when I come back from the ring, you're going to hand it back to me. Pretty smart. That's, that's the foolproof way to fucking take care of a thief without, if you can't prove it, if it got proved, everybody's, you know, anybody that got proved, they stole something, either got fired or beat up or both. But a lot of times you couldn't prove it. So you would just make it more difficult and kind of send them a message. And see, so that was, that's, I've watched, I've had Flair's fucking Rolex in my pocket. I've had fucking fanny packs for guys because, you know, when you would go to different territories sometimes, or uh, maybe have, so, you know, be in a new environment, you'd go to somebody that you knew and say, hey, here's my shit, keep an eye on it, whatever the fuck. And I'm in the first time we worked Kansas City, me and the Midnight Express were booked there from Dallas, world class in 1985. And fuck, you know, it, it was Kansas City and St. Louis. We all St. Louis Keel Auditorium. This is going to be a big deal, but it was three years after Sam Muchnick's retirement. And they had like a, you know, the, there was 1,200 people there. And Kansas City was half of that. It was the shits. And we walked in the locker room and we looked at guys that had duct tape holding their boots, their toe of their boots together where they'd flapped out and they had to tape it up. And it just, it was the dying days of a fucking territory that wasn't, major in its day and we took all our shit we never had a problem with our shit you know with especially working in major territories there wasn't any thieves on a regular basis in crockett or in you know wcw or whatever but we took all our shit back out to the rental car and locked it in the fucking uh glove compartment because we just saw this this you know the guys are in such need here it it was it was a downer it was sad but nobody was making any money there at that time we're just like, ah fuck we'll just we'll see uh and as a matter of fact that's one of the nights flair was there in st louis that's one of the nights i held his watch because he's gonna leave a fucking fifteen thousand dollar rolex laying around where guys are making 250 dollars a week 
you know, so, but it, it didn't happen a lot, but, and a, most of the major thefts that you hear about, I'll close with this from locker rooms or from wrestling events were when nobody was in the locker room for whatever reason, they didn't have a guard on the door or somebody turned their back and somebody went in and made off with a belt or a robe or a something that they wanted as a souvenir that, you know, was recognizable. Flair lost robes, guys have lost belts, jackets, you know, different things. And, you know, it, not money, but things that a, a fan or an outsider would take if they got the opportunity. And that's been the biggest thefts, you know, that, uh, that I remember out of wrestling events, except by the promoters at the box office. And anytime Captain Ed George was watching the Kobo box office for the Sheik, they had a lot of robberies then. What about Dick Steinborn? You know, I've heard that and I hate it because Dick Steinborn, I met him in, in 77. I just started as the photographer in Louisville, like less than a year before. And he came through and he was a quite a good photographer and also had been in the wrestling business 25 years, was a really good worker. And his father, Milo Steinborn, one of the most famous, you know, strong men is, you know, written up in a lot of books. And he was very nice, gave me a lot of f advice on photography, more advanced than I was at the time, you know, with bounce flashes and slave units and stuff, just pointing this and that out. And was just a really nice guy and wasn't here long, but never had anything but good to say about our interaction. And then I've heard stories years gone by that he was light fingered Louie. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know.